You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda from New York City. And this is Prashant Parmaswaran from Washington, D.C. How's it going today, Prashant? Good. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. It's good to be back with you in 2019 to uh, mm-hmm. continue the Asia Geopolitics podcast. And I think we have a pretty uh, logical thing to talk about today, which is the United States passage of the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act. We talked a bit about it last year when it was still a congressional initiative. But on the very mm-hmm. final day of 2018, uh, U.S. President Donald Trump signed the act into law. Uh, so this adds to a set of policy documents and initiatives coming out of the U.S. since early 2017. I'm thinking here, obviously, of the administration's 2017 national security strategy, the early 2018 national defense strategy, and now we have the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, all of this sort of coordinating a broad sense that the United States is coming together in a cohesive way towards the Indo-Pacific. And the significant thing about ARIA, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, is that it's primarily a a congressional initiative. So it's an attempt by the legislative branch to make its imprints known on Asia policy. Um, And the act, I'll just briefly talk a bit about what it does for our listeners that might not have been keeping up with it. But broadly, it it calls on the White House to work to develop a long-term strategic vision and a comprehensive, multifaceted, and principled U.S. policy for the Indo-Pacific region and for other purposes. So it doesn't in itself provide a strategic vision. It calls on the United States to come up with one, which I think is an important distinction. Um, And it's a pretty comprehensive document. Uh, It definitely incorporates that new geographic understanding of what the Indo-Pacific region is. Uh, namely everything from the western shore of India, of Gujarat, all the way to the international dateline covering the entire western Pacific and Oceania. So the act has recommendations for the U.S.-China relationship, the U.S.-India relationship, the U.S.-ASEAN relationship, the relationship with Northeast Asian treaty allies, South Korea and Japan. It includes a portion on the Quad, uh, the concert of democracies with India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. Um, There's a lot on the commitment to Taiwan, which makes particular sense given that Congress uh, ultimately takes the lead on relations with Taiwan under the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, There's a bit about North Korea, New Zealand, Pacific Island states, um, big focus on the South China Sea as well, uh, in addition to sort of thematic issues including terrorism, human rights, cybersecurity, nonproliferation. So this act does say a lot, um, but, you know, I think I think maybe I'll uh, turn it over to you a bit, um, you know, to give us a bit of a, an appraisal of what you think that Araya does right, and and maybe Prashant, you can give us a bit of the perspective um, from the Southeast Asian region, especially towards the DACT, um, since uh, ASEAN, I think, is is an important focus here. Yeah, I mean, I think the way you framed it is 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 exactly right, which is that um, you know this is something that's not entirely new. When when we were at the Shangri La dialogue, um, you know, last year. Uh, you know, the congressmen were actively sort of promoting this and their staff as well about um, how this is going to buttress uh, U.S. Asia policy under Trump. Uh, and, and they were presenting it in, in you know, sort of two aspects, right? One is continuity with respect to Congress's role in U.S. Asia policy, which is recognized as, you know, a, a sort of a domain of bipartisanship in general about Asia's importance and the importance for the United States to engage, but also a recognition that under the Trump administration, there's more of a need for this reassurance, which is, the, I think, the key word uh, in, in this initiative, right? That um, there are allies um, and friends of the United States in the region that really feel very nervous about uh, some of the things that the Trump administration has been doing, even as we've seen um, a lot of the documents come out about the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. So that's one aspect of it. Um, I think that's that's sort of uh, in conflict with another aspect of that, which is, um, you know, the timing of this initiative, right? Um, so this is something which, um, you know, even though it's been discussed for a long time, it was only recently passed. Um, and it's passed at a time when I think there's a lot of questions about what Congress's role is going to be in terms of U.S. Asia policy, right? We had the midterm elections recently where we saw um, a rebuke of President Trump and, and Democrats taking a more prominent uh, position, particularly in the House. And I think the big question for U.S. Asia policy with respect to Congress's role in 2019 is, you know, is it co- going to continue to be that ballast uh, in terms of bipartisanship for U.S. Asia policy? Or are we going to see that 
overshadowed by uh, growing partisanship. And we're talking, you know, right now in the midst of here in Washington, D.C., right, like a, a continued government shutdown, um, questions about how this might impact uh, foreign policy. So I think, you know, the, the act itself unquestionably, um, it, you know, it, it reinforces Congress's role uh, as a key variable in U.S.-Asia policy. But I think there are big questions about what that actually means in 2019, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I neglected to mention was that the big thing that um, Araya does is authorize $1.5 mm -hmm. in spending um, if, if and when the White House chooses to avail itself of that spending to support a range of projects in and around the region. So it, it puts money where the United States' mouth has been since early 2017 in the Asia-Pacific. Um, and another observation I'd offer is that you know, just the name itself, the Asia Reassurance Initiative uh, Act, um, harkens back to the Obama administration's 2014 European Reassurance Initiative, uh, which was an executive initiative, was not an act of Congress, but that came after Russia's annexation of Crimea, and it was sort of a, a gesture to remind Europe that after that acute incident, the United States remained committed. And in Asia, we don't necessarily have that kind of an acute event to really point to, right? We have sort of years of stewing kind of gray zone tactics in the South China Sea, broader concerns growing about Chinese um, assertions around mm -hmm. the region. Um, but, you know, this comes at a time when, as you correctly pointed out, there are concerns about reassurance in the region. Um, but, you know, I mean, the problem that I see with Araya and the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, even, uh, you know, high level addresses coming out of the State Department on the Indo-Pacific strategy policy documents is that it doesn't get around the the Trump sized problem in this administration. I mean, uh, you know, we had those recent polls come out at the end of 2018 um, looking at Southeast Asian perceptions of the United States and other regional actors. And while you know, many of these countries continue to be pro-American and continue to welcome an American role in the region, especially partners and allied states. Um, they have fundamental concerns about the U.S. president himself. And given the nature of the U.S. political system and the nature in particular of how foreign policy is enacted, um, it doesn't matter how much bipartisanship you have, how much congressional interest you have, how institutionalized bureaucratic exchanges continue. What matters at the end of the day is you need a president who is both engaged in Asia and says the right things. Right. And after Trump's, um, you know, no show at the usual November round of summitry, which I think, you know, some people welcomed in the sense that he didn't go and cause the kind of headlines that you don't necessarily want to have. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think it, it it causes some issues with that whole reassurance um, project that um, all of these initiatives, I think, uh, are trying to do. So I think that's a problem that Araya really can't address. Um, and really, the only way to address that is either for, you know, Donald Trump to become a different kind of president um, or for a change in the administration to take place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's that's the key question and you hit on it, which is, um, you know, is this administration an administration that, I mean, obviously the United States is a global superpower. It has to deal with various regions, but is Asia recognized as a primary or, or the primary theater for the United States, given that, um, you know, when you talk about great powers, the U.S.-China uh, relationship is going to be one that's going to be significantly important for the United States moving forward. And I think, you know, if you look at the documents that are coming out, national security strategy, national defense strategy, and you talk to policymakers, there's definitely a recognition that that is the case. But that is, uh, you know, there's sort of a disconnect between that as well, uh, in addition to what the president's been saying, which is, you know, President Trump doesn't have a significant tendencies uh, that lean in favor of Asia in the way that President Obama did, which is I think he recognized strategically that Asia was a place, uh, you know, where America's prosperity was wedded to the region, and it's also a place where, unlike the Middle East, the United States doesn't have to be as involved there militarily, uh, so to speak. I think President Trump shares some of those tendencies, but it's not clear that that means that he has a strategic direction that is in favor of, you know, what one might call an Asia first U.S. foreign policy. Right. And I think that's where this whole uh, ARIA initiative comes into play, right, where Congress is trying to serve as that reminder that, yes, absolutely, the United States, it you know, does value Asia and does have a significant priority in Asia. But whether or not the president shares that view and is going to share that view in 2019 and 2020 in this environment of increasing uh, partisanship leading up to the 2020 uh, presidential elections, uh, that remains to be seen very much so.
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the signals around this have been um, contradictory, and I think there's many ways to kind of put together a narrative, right? On one hand, you can point to the fact that U.S.-China relations have sort of become a central guiding question um, in this administration. And even if Trump doesn't necessarily share the views that were articulated by the Mattis Pentagon and the national defense strategy and the national security strategy, um, that, you know, great power competition was back. He certainly said things and behaved in ways that suggest that he does at least share a recognition that the U.S.-China relationship is a central question right now for the United States. And also there's all of his diplomacy with North Korea, really the only area in foreign affairs where, he, where, where he's been able to take at least some credit um, for uh, accomplishing something. I mean, you know, whether that credit is well-placed or not is another question, but Mm -hmm. uh, undoubtedly, I think, you know, he sees that as one of his important um, victories on the world stage. But at the second time, I mean, you know, the primary theater is effectively North America, right? I mean, on his, um, during his inaugural address, almost exactly two years ago, he articulated the America First vision, which, uh, you know, has been focused on border security and are really, um, retrenchment. Um, and, and we also see this in how he's making decisions in the Middle East. Um, so I think, I think, I think that you're right that obviously that Trump is not an Asia first president. Um, but you know, it, it, it is still, uh, unclear exactly how he's been managing the contradictions between the rhetoric of, of America first and what his administration has actually been doing. Um, but, you know, amid all of this, um, the the reassurance problem, I think, is is hard to get around. And look, I mean, you know, we talk about reassurance uh, even when you don't have a President Trump in office. Reassurance is sort of one of those things that comes up regardless of who's in charge and what the broader mm-hmm. security environment is. And, and the fact of the matter is that reassurance is hard and maybe you don't ever get to a point with your allies and partners where they are fully reassured. I mean, I think that's especially true in the case of, um, you know, certain countries like, um, like Japan, South Korea. I mean, a reassurance is really a continuous ongoing process rather than a destination to be arrived at. Um, so I think initiatives like this one um, from Congress, I think, are going to be welcome. And I think they provide an important sort of baseline for, you know, a future Democratic administration, for example, that's continuing to um, that might continue to recognize that Asia is really the future uh, for the United States in the 21st century and um, and work to build a new kind of American foreign policy around that. Um, yep. But let's talk a bit about, you know, some of those specifics in the act. Um, so in Taiwan, um, the Taiwanese press really picked up on uh, this act's passage, probably, I think, more than any other country, as far as I was mm-hmm. able to notice. Um, and it's not surprising. I mean, given the um, the increase in cross-strait tensions and, uh, you know, the New Year's uh, Eve, I believe, threats from uh, Xi Jinping that, or, you know, reunification or unification Across the Taiwan Strait is inevitable, so this comes as a as a welcome signal for Taiwan. So I think if if the reassurance part of this act has had the greatest effect anywhere, I think it probably was in Taiwan. Um, and um, you know another another observation that I sort of had was um, you know some of the things that Ar- Araya does on North Korea strategy I think are a little bit odd. Um, I mean, for example, any uh, the act calls for any act of um, sanctions relief towards North Korea to be justified in writing by the White House. So the White House would have to point out what exactly North Korea has done in order to merit sanctions relief, which might make it difficult in the context of ongoing uh, diplomacy where the United States might have to, you know, give up interim sanctions relief to North Korea without any kind of concrete concessions on the nuclear issue. So that, again, I think is a little bit odd. Um, You know, at the introduction, I did point out that the act recognizes the new geography of the Indo-Pacific, um, mm-hmm. but certainly it continues to be heavily skewed towards East and Southeast Asia. I mean, there is a discussion of the U.S.-India partnership, um, but, you know, as far as I can tell, there's no uh, dedicated section on the Indian Ocean, for instance. Um, so, you know, there are these sort of gaps um, in in what the act does that I think do sort of suggest a bit of legacy thinking um, and not particularly innovation when it comes to uh, thinking about Asia. I don't know. um, I don't know if you had any uh, specific remarks maybe on the Southeast Asia components. No, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, the... You, you highlighted the, the key word at the beginning of the conversation, which is, you know, it's comprehensive. And that can cut both ways, right? So on on the one hand, 
I think Congress historically has served as a, a real ballast for U.S. Asia policy, not just in terms of the defense or security side, because the Pentagon and the De uh, Defense Department are pretty well funded, but particularly on human rights um, and some of these other people-to-people -people connections, and then also reinforcing the the sort of economic pillar of this, because a lot of the, the, the trade agreements have to be uh, ratified by Congress before they go into law. And I think that's the, the strength of the comprehensiveness of this. If you look at the language of ARIA, there, there's a very deliberate uh, need and there's a very deliberate uh, sort of priority placed on reinforcing the diplomatic and economic aspects, which I think a lot of uh, allies and friends of the United States in the region are worried about, right? They're less worried about the security components because the DOD and the Pentagon are very well funded and a lot of there's a lot of continuity between those priorities. So I think that's good. But the on the other side of it, um, when you look at the comprehensiveness and you look at that relative to the funding, which is, you know, 1.5 billion allocated initially for five years, um, there is a question, and, and we heard this, you know, and we've heard this throughout the year, actually, in, in, in Asia, and when the, we were doing this briefing at the Shangri-La Dialogue, there were a lot of questions about how, I mean, there's so many priorities here, you know, whether it's um, supporting human rights defenders in the Asia Pacific or uh, promoting people-to-people -people exchanges or, or security and capacity building, you know, how can you do all of this with, you know, 1.5 billion per year or 7.5 billion over five years? And I think, you know, that's always going to be a conversation uh, in U.S. Asia policy. There really isn't that um, amount of funding that can be sort of put side by side with what the Chinese are doing, um, which leads to your point about how, you know, there's always going to be a certain amount of reassurance that you need for allies and friends in the region, right? And we won't be entirely reassured on that. One other thing I, I note about ARIA that's really interesting is uh, I think, um, you know, with uh, the national security strategy and the national defense strategy, um, there was a focus on state-based uh, threats and major power competition, particularly with respect to China and also Russia and, and to a certain extent, North Korea and Iran. Here, it really does, as you said, put a focus on Southeast Asia and the counterterrorism threat with, with the Islamist with, with the Islamic State, which I think, you know, the 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 more sort of um, the, the, the sort of harder or more blunter assessments of the national security strategy and the national defense strategy was that we're going to move away from these transnational threats and towards more state based threats. Uh, I think um, the, it's a more comprehensive vision with respect to ARIA, where I think there's a recognition that First, you know, there's going to be have to be a multi-pronged approach, not just defense, but you know, economic diplomacy, people to people, but also the the kind of threats that the United States has to worry about really is broad-based. It's not just China or North Korea or Iran. It's also uh, terrorism, state-based actors, the notion of Chinese influence more generally. Uh, I think is recognized um, in, in, and I think that's a very deliberate effort to try to say that. You know, we do have to worry about these other threats, and the United States is not taking its eye off the ball on that. Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, so I think we both, you know, generally agree about the comprehensive and I guess sort of confusing nature of, uh, um, you know, what Araya is trying to do. And I guess broadly speaking, maybe the conclusion is that, you know, the the fact that we still don't have a an Asia strategy, so to speak. I mean, we have sort of chunks here and there, um, a lot of continuity um, across the administrations, which is maybe not continuity in a good way if you were actually looking for, um, you know, a, a 10, 20, 30 year plan of what the United States might do in Asia and how it's going to particularly contend with challenges like the South China Sea. I mean, again, with the South China Sea, which is something we've talked about a lot on this podcast, um, the language in Araya, I mean, you know, recognizes that China's illegal construction and militarization of features is a problem. Um, but the prescriptions are not innovative, right? I mean, there's just mm -hmm. lip service towards a code of conduct, um, not even a binding code of conduct, I think. I mean, it's really, um, it's really, you know, at this point, it's a little bit disappointing. Um, but I think, you know, this, I think, suggests that there is a bit of space here for, um, you know, as we head into the 2020 presidential season for um, challengers to President Trump to think more seriously about a U.S. foreign policy in Asia. Uh, I mean, you know, we have seen presidential elections dominated by issues like the Middle East. And obviously, I think Russia and NATO are going to be a big issue in the 2020 election, uh, which is not going to be a foreign policy election by any means. Um, but if and when foreign policy comes up, you know, I'm not expecting to see Asia take front and center. Um, but I think that's really an opportunity for uh, potential, you know, democratic challengers uh, to 
to President Trump to kind of um, make that an emphasis of their foreign policy platforms. And really, I think, uh, show many of these partner and allied states in Asia that there is serious thinking about a U.S. strategy towards the region. Absolutely. And I think looking ahead to 2019 and 2022, I mean, there is this broader conversation about about Congress's role in, in U.S.-Asia policy. And that, I mean, while its role in, in U.S.-Asia policy in terms of oversight and, and so on and so forth continues to remain the same, there really has been this continuing conversation in, in Washington, D.C. and on Capitol Hill about how we have lost a number of key influencers within Congress, right? Whether it's um, John McCain uh, or it's, you know, Senator Richard Lugar looking back a few years back. Um, and, and there really is more of an attention on who are the newer individuals who are going to take an interest in Asia. And I think that's one of the other pieces of the conversation that will be really interesting to watch. You know, who, who really grabs the sort of Asia mantle in U.S. foreign policy going forward in 2019 and 2020? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, Prashant, I think we'll leave it there for today. Sounds good. All right. Great. Uh, For listeners, thanks a lot for continuing to listen to the Asia Geopolitics podcast. This year in February will mark five years since we launched the podcast, which is an exciting milestone that we're looking forward to hitting. In the meantime, uh, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do that so you don't miss future episodes. And if you have been a subscriber for a while, but you haven't yet left us a review on either iTunes or Google Play, please do that. Uh, It really helps get the word out about the show. So thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back next week with more.